Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, virtual talk. It's been my, the first virtual talk I ever do. So welcome to my home in Berlin. This feels uh, weirdly intimate since you are all here somehow in my bedroom and also exactly the opposite since I can see nobody's faces. Um, my name is Juan Pedro. Uh, I am a consultant working around interactive software and value-oriented design. And I live in Berlin. And yeah, since uh, you may know, a lot of my work is preoccupied with value-oriented design. This is with using value semantics as a guiding, a fundamental guiding principle in the design of our systems. However, real-world C++ systems are often written instead in an object-oriented style. And it is very important for us to reconcile these two design philosophies so we can, in practice, use value-oriented design, which is, uh, I would say, a very modern and, um, and more um, updated way of, um, of using uh, C++. Anyway, um, so before we proceed, uh, this session is one hour and a half long. Um, I have here the Q&A section open. This should help um, uh, making questions as we go. Um, I will try to check them and to answer the questions as we go, to have a little bit of a sense of interactivity in this um, uh, strange <laughs> virtual situation. Anyway, let's proceed with the talk and let's talk about how can we square the circles. So this talk is about circles and squares. A square is an object. It is a box that occupies space and potentially time. However, a value may be represented as a circle. And I think this is nice because at the end, if you zoom out a circle, we can see as a point. And a point is a dimensional because values, values in a pure sense, not even in a value semantic sense, just values as mathematical values, they are an abstract entities, they are immaterial, they are necessary, they are eternal and immutable, right? They are concepts that we use to model the world. However, when we program, we have to put these values somewhere. We put them in boxes. And these boxes are objects. They are concrete entities made of memory. They are material that are contingent, you know, made of atoms and electricity. And they are temporary and they are mutable, right? Objects is the bread and butter of C++. Now, when we're talking about values, we attribute meaning through relationships and we extract uh, abstract things through naming. So we may have a point which represents a value, and this point simply floating in the void doesn't mean anything really. However, as soon as we have other points and connections between them, meaning starts to arise. Because one point is the number two, the other point may be the number three. It's related through a summing operation, and in the end, we relate it to another result. And the summing operation uh, gets meaning through the relationship between uh, that we're establishing here through these uh, three other values. Um, and there are programming languages where this fundamental principle of abstracting via naming values is, tried, is represented in a very direct form. In Haskell, for example, we can directly name values. And when we say let x equals to let sum equals a lambda, blah, blah, we're not naming objects, we're naming, or at least um, we are simulating that we're actually naming a value directly. However, um, we are not programming in Haskell, this is a C++ conference, so we use programming languages that look like this, where I say int foo equals 42 in a block. When I do this, what I'm naming here is not a value. This is a very important thing. In C++, even though int is a value type, I am always naming an object. I am naming a box in memory called foo in which we store 
a representation of the value 42. Now, we actually know that this is an object because it actually has an identity, an identity that identifies the box, which is its pointer value that I can extract and use as a value that is stored in a separate box that relate each other. I can even do fancy things like actually modify the first box through the pointer, right? So in C++, the fundamental entity that we use to program is this notion of object, which is the combination of a location with a type and a lifetime. A location in memory, the type that determines what kind of values I can put in it, what kind of operations are supported by uh, this object, and a lifetime that determines when is this um, object valid, when is this uh, region of memory uh, associated to this object. And that, in the case above, is automatically determined by the uh, braces. Now, the philosopher Wittgenstein said that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And I think that this leads to a consequence in C++ programming, which is a kind of disease that many of us have which is object fetishism, which means that when all you can name is an object, everything looks like an object. We start thinking in terms of squares, in terms of objects, when modeling and understanding the world, instead of thinking in the more abstract sense of values. Let's look at an example. I may want to have a program uh, where I I'm modeling a house which has a vector of rooms and each room has, let's say, a name and a light switch that determines whether the light is on or off. This is all very valuable uh, so far. However, what happens when we want to introduce doors? Now, a door is a connection between two rooms. So a C++ programmer will go ahead and say, well, a door is a pair of pointers um, to the rooms that it connects. Now, the problem is, as soon as we do this, now we are not thinking of the house and the room as values, we are thinking of them as objects because we are using the identity of the objects that are used to store this information. And we get into, for example, lifetime problems, right? So the rooms, uh, vector now that before had values, now it has con to contain rooms, objects with stable identities. And we know that vector, the vector type, when you push stuff into it, doesn't preserve the identity of the objects in it. So we have to use, let's say, a unique pointer. But that could also lead to uh, data leakage. So instead, maybe we end up using a shared pointer to make sure uh, that we can track with a weak pointer that uh, the doors are pointing to rooms that actually exist. However, why did we get into this trouble? We got into this trouble because we are using, again, the identity of the objects as the identity for the rooms. Instead, we could say there is a room identity that is an explicit value, an explicit type in a program, and the doors connect rooms identified by this identity value. Since we have the rooms stored in a vector, this identity value actually could be, for example, the position of the room in the vector, so it's index. Um, but we could, of course, do something more fancy where the rooms are stored in a map that associates the IDs to the specific rooms. Um, and the nice thing about this is that we get more flexible about the data structures that we use, right? So the doors could also be uh, stored, for example, in a boost mode index for more efficient lookups of the doors or something else. Now, interestingly, in C++, um, we have this thing called value semantics that allows us to actually move easily between the world of value semantics and not value semantics. For example, the data model that I just described 
it can still be used in an objective way by having a function like this one that takes a house by reference. And since it's a reference, it is an object, right? Uh, that, it, that is an object there that we're pointing to and modifies it in place. So when we call this function, the light is turned on in place, right? In the object, bang, bang, bang. It modifies a certain particular object. But we can design this function in a more valuable way by saying, well, instead of taking a, a house by reference, it takes a house by value, and it returns a new version of the house with the light turned on. Interestingly, in C++, we have this feature called value cons um, copy constructors um, and copy assignment. So we can even just use the function above to implement the function below using uh, passing by value as uh, the way to, to, to protect um, these, uh, uh, these values and introduce new local objects that um, store this this value. Um, as a C++ developer, though, you may be thinking, well, that way of programming, though, is very inefficient because you're copying all the data all the time and you're copying, in this case, we had maps and vectors that are slow to copy. So this is not going to work. However, um, that doesn't need to be the case if you use data structures that are actually designed to be used in a value-oriented way. And I've done quite a few talks on this topic. Uh, there is this talk called Postmodern Immutable Data Structures. Um, I actually did give this talk uh, last year at the same conference uh, in the UK uh, before we had a apocalypse going on. Um, and uh, you can check the video on YouTube if you're interested. So um, I'm going to assume through this talk that actually Passing things by value is efficient. If you are not familiar with immutable data structures, please make a leap of faith and trust me on this one. Now, there is one topic, though, at which object-oriented programming is quite good in a way, and this is modularity. What do I mean by modularity in this context? Let's go back to the data model that was designed in an object-oriented way. So we had share pointers and whatnot, um, and mutable objects that represent um, the things in our model. And we're going to add here a boost signal that notifies, uh, is notified when the light is changed. Uh, for those that are not familiar with this concept, a boost signal is an instance, an implementation of the observer pattern. So you can connect to this um, signal with a lambda, and this lambda will be called whenever the signal is emitted. Once we have um, done this change, we can write a UI for this uh, model for a room of our model that I call here room component. And this is using like a fictional um, UI toolkit here. So there is this widget button thing here that has an API similar to what oftentimes object-oriented UI uh, libraries like Qt or GTK uh, provide. Now this room component is instantiated with a shared pointer to a room. And this share pointer rather provides a sense of modularity. It decouples the lifetime of the room object from the lifetime of the room component. Then we connect to an on-click signal that is provided by the button. And whenever it's clicked, we modify the state of the model and we notify that a change has occurred. This notification, we will uh, listened to from this component, and it could also potentially be listened by other components that we don't know of. This is how we achieve a sense of modularity. And uh, we do so by um, calling this update function that updates the text of the button um, 
accordingly to the current state of the model. Now, this provides a sense of modularity because um, I can have, I have implemented this room component only knowing about rooms, right? I don't know about houses here. However, I can have an instance of the model of the house. We can see this here. And you can instantiate this room component. I can click the buttons and I can see the state change. And because we're talking about objects, the state changes in place and the connections in this bottom part of the diagram uh, behave independent of the house. Now, we have modularity, but we have lost some power of composition because there is no abstraction here and we're lying to ourselves sometimes believing that there is a sense of abstraction. Let's say I'm a programmer of a component A that uses a component B or it's an aggregate of a component B. You may think that you can reason locally about the state of B. However, when you call a method on B, since everything is a graph of on objects with callbacks, and here we see through the dotted line that actually there is even a callback between an object reference from B back to the root, actually any part of the state can change whenever you call a method on B. So to really understand what's going on when you call a method on B from A, you actually ne need to have a total understanding of the system. We don't really compose here. And those of you that have worked on large legacy uh, projects with UI may know that these kind of issues are actually very hard to debug. So instead, I would suggest to go back to our data model that we could represent wholly as simple structs with value IDs that can be represented as a whole value without thinking in object terms. Then, this value I'm going to put in a box that sits at the core of our system. And this is what's called the single atom architecture that is very often used in um, Clojure. This is actually where I borrow this name, but that is now very used actually in other languages, uh, functional and otherwise, even in JavaScript. Now, the problem that we have here, though, is that, well, I have this big box that contains the house, when I want to turn on the light, I need to somehow take the light, take the house out, define how a house looks like with the light turned on and put it back in the box. How can I do this in a modular way? One way to achieve this is the unidirectional data flow architecture that is implemented by libraries like Redux, uh, you may know from JavaScript, like programming languages like Elm, and with the library Lagger that I implemented for C++, and I will link later in the, in the documentation. In the unidirectional data flow architecture, you split your components in action models and views. This looks quite similar to the typical MVC, uh, MVC model view controller uh, design. However, there is a fundamental difference. In MVC, model views and controllers, they represent objects that know about each other through pointers and have certain APIs. Here, action models and views, they are values. And the arrows between them, they are not references, they are functions, they are relationships between them. So there is an update function that will take the current state of the world, the current model, an action that represents something that the user is trying to do, and returns an updated version of the model. Then there is a render function that takes the current model and returns a view value. Finally, to glue things together, there has to be somewhere uh, close to the views a dispatch method that allows us to feed new elements, uh, feed, sorry, new actions back into the system. Um, one crucial thing here, though, is also that for the views, um, to be able to really have the view represented as a value, you need a library like React to do it efficiently. But in C++, we can get around um, the issue by using an immediate mode API, like imgui or dear imgui, uh, where we have like a draw function that implicitly describes the view as a call stack. Let's see how this will look um, 
with a room and house model. We have a room model, which is a, as we saw, a struct with the fundamental data that we need for a room, its name, and the switch on state of the light. Now we need the actions. The actions describe as a value what we can do with this room. We can have different structs here that define different types of things that can happen. For example, toggle the light, that, that could be, for example, a rename action or other kinds of action. Um, and then we combine all these different kinds of actions, all these different kinds of things that, that we can do with a, with a room uh, using an STD variant. Now we need to define our update function. Here, as we said before, we take our model as a value, we take the action as a value, and we return a new model. Uh, what we do is to inspect the action, see what type of action is it, uh, this is. And for this, I use this utility called lagger match, which is more or less uh, like using std visit, um, but with a nicer syntax. Um, so we can inspect what's um, in this std variant. And if the action uh, is uh, a light switch action, then we toggle the light and return the updated model. Finally, we need our view. And as I said before, we can use a immediate mode UI. For this, we take um, the current state of the model as a, as a value. In this case, we take the value as a const reference because we don't need to modify it. We're just going to uh, read it. And we take this type lagger context of room action. And this lagger context, what it does is to provide us this dispatch function that we can use to um, deliver new actions, in this case, actions of type room action. In the function, we just draw the button by calling him GUI button using the text appropriate to the current state. And if the button has been pressed, we dispatch an action. Now, this is modular, right? Here, there is no reference to the house in any way. Uh, now we can compose, use composition rules to define our house model. And our house model is, as we suggested before, a vector of rooms or room models. And why not? We may have, for example, doors, which is a vector of pairs of ints. Now, we compose the actions by having the house action have potentially various kinds of actions. And one of the type of actions is going to be a pair of an int and a room action that says that there is a room action that has to be delivered to the room in position and position determined by the integer. Now, we also need a... Um, We also need a update function that, um, in this case, again, takes a house model and a house action and returns an updated house model. We inspect this action, and we find that if we find out that the action is this pair of an int with a room action, we look up the room at the position. We call the update function that we saw we actually implemented before the, um, the update function that takes a room and a room action uh, and return a model with the room, uh, the room updated. Finally, we can implement the draw function where at some point we iterate over the rooms and we call the draw function that we saw before of the room. Interestingly, we need to pass it a context. Now, the context that we have here is a context that can take house actions. If actually room action was directly part of the variant of, um, of the house action, we could directly pass this context and it will convert automatically properly. But in this case, we need to also teach lagger or teach the lagger context how to add the index 
to the room action whenever it's dispatched. So in this case, uh, we do this by passing this lambda that whenever it gets a room action, it uh, pairs it with the um, index of the room at hand. Finally, uh, once we have the model action and view that we described, we can use the Lagger library to bind all, to glue all these things together using the make store function, uh, to which we pass the action type of our application, the model type, the root update function, and we watch the store for changes, calling draw on our UI whenever the data model changes. And we finally have some kind of event loop where um, we, we are uh, emitting also new actions uh, from sources, external sources. Um, now, this, um, there, there's much more I could talk about this approach, this Redux approach. Um, and this works very nicely. If you're starting an application from scratch where you want to use value-oriented design, I would really suggest actually exploring uh, using this approach. There is another talk I did focusing precisely on this topic called the most valuable values at CPPCon um, 2018. You have the video link here. However, this value-oriented approach has um, a very idealistic, it's very idealistic. And this idealism happens often not only in software engineering, it also happened at some point in the beginning of the 20th um, century, there were architects and urbanists that tried to make utopian new cities designed from scratch under modernist ideals, like the vertical city from Hilbertsheim or the radiant city by Le Corbusier, which by the way, it's quite squared, it may have been designed by an object-oriented programmer. Or this one, the by Howard, the Garden City, that may, due to its uh, many circles, designed by a value-oriented programmer. Anyway, these cities are quite interesting in the values that they approach or that they, that they have, but are not real cities where people live in the end. Real cities look like this. Uh, this is a map of Rome, which is a city that is millennia old, uh, like many cities uh, in the south of Europe, also even my hometown, Huelva, in the south of Spain, even though it's small, it's also millennia old. And these cities, they have evolved through different eras, technological eras, economic societies, ways of organizing the world. And they have different parts that somehow, when you look at them in a the map, they don't make sense from a rational point of view, but they organically grew to be the way they are. C++ legacy systems in which we work, I believe, are often like this. C++ is a more than 30-year-old language, and it supports like at least four different programming paradigms. And, you know, projects that are that old, there are different architects that come and go, there are different trends that are followed, and there are also different requirements at different times uh, that are followed and tried to implement. And eventually, we have legacy systems that are, well, organic, let's say. So if we cannot start from scratch, we cannot apply that very um, elegant composition model of the Redux architecture, where eventually we have all our system uh, designed as values until the root, where we have a little bit of glue with the store, and that's it. Um, so let's talk about something else as a solution to this problem. Let's talk about cursors. Let's think about what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve a single atom architecture. This is one box that has a value in it. Let's think of the box, right? The box is this object. What is the API that we want to have in this box? In a basic way, we can say that the box may have a value of type T, 
this box we name here state. It, it is a piece of state in our application. And we can get the value in the box. We can set the value, put a new value in the box. And we can potentially also watch the box to get notified when the value changes. So we can write a new I for this, um, for whatever is stored in this box. We can implement this simply by using a shared pointer to a kind of node that actually has the, store, uh, the state in memory and that has the current value, has potentially a signal, and um, we store this in a shared pointer because this allows us, as we said before, to decouple maybe the lifetime of the people accessing the states from the lifetime of the state itself. And we can, once we have this data, implement, get, set, and watch in a more or less trivial way. Now, this implementation is just here for an example. We will see eventually a library that, of course, uses a more sophisticated implementation. Now, interestingly, once we have this state thing, um, we can try to change our room component that we designed before for an object-oriented model to, uh, we can turn it into a component that, um, that instead uses this state as a source of, um, <laughs> as a source of state. Um, so we change the room component to take the state um, as an argument. Now the state in this case has the house. So, right, it's the big box we said that has everything. It has the value that represents everything in it. So it has the house and it has the room ID because the room component is concerned only with one room. Now, when the button is clicked, we get the current value, the current house value out of the box. We switch the light of the room um, of the ID that we are interested in. And then we update the state to contain the house updated. Then when we change, uh, when anything changes in the state, we look at the room of the ID uh, with the given ID to see whether the light is on and turn uh, set the text accordingly. And we watch also, sorry, we watch the uh, the state for changes. Uh, and call update whenever um, whenever it changes. Now, this is not great, right? And it's not great for basically one fundamental reason. This is not modular. Why does the room component need to know about the house? The developer of the room component should not be concerned with houses. Is there something we can do about it? Well, we can introduce lenses for a risk queue. Lenses is a concept that we bring from the world of functional programming, and indeed there are something called functional references, because it tries to help solve this problem of modularity in the same way that references help solve the problem of modularity in an stateful world. And a lens can be thought of as this magnifying glass that you can put on top of a thing let's say a house, and zoom into a particular part of the thing. For example, the switch on state of the light bulb in a particular room of the house. Interestingly, the lens works both ways. So you can use it to get the current state of the light, but you can also use it to get a new house with the light updated when, to one, when you want to switch the light. Let's see how this looks in practice. We have changed the room component again that we designed before to take a state, but in this case, we don't know what the state contains. The state can have anything. It can have a house. It can have something else. We don't care. Because we also have an object at hand called lens 
that the person that instantiates the room passes um, that will allow us to get from this big thing, for example, the house, into whatever part we're interested in. For example, the room or the light on state in the room. Now, whenever we want to get the light on state, we use this function of the lens API called view, where we pass the getter, sorry, we, when we pass the value, the house value, for example, we pass the lens and we expect to get the Boolean of the light on switch. When we want to update the house, now we don't know whether we have a house here, but we know we have a something, we have the lens and we have the new state and we pass all this to the put function that will give us an updated house, an updated big thing that we can then put in the state. We also use the view here whenever we want to get the, the current value and we achieved somehow modularity. Now, what is this lens thing? Where the easier way to understand a lens is through what I call the naive implementation of a lens. There are other implementations of the lens that I will mention later. A naive implementation of a lens is basically two functions, right? One that corresponds to the view function that we saw. This is the getter. This is a function that takes a hole, and by a hole, I mean the big thing, the house, and returns part a part of it. For example, the Boolean state of the light in one of the rooms. Then there is the setter, and the setter takes a hole, takes a part, and returns a new hole with the part updated. Once we have these two functions, we can implement view and put, the two functions that we used in a room component, in a more or less trivial way, just calling uh, calling the first or the second function of the lens. <clears throat> now, once we have defined our lens like this, uh, we can finally get define a room light on lens. This room light on lens will allow us to get from the house to the light on state, right? And we do this by having these two functions. The first one, uh, the first one gets the house and returns this boolean, and the sum, the second one gets the house, gets the boolean, and returns a house with the boolean updated. <clears throat> Once we have this lens, we can now finally instantiate a room component with the state that, um, and the room components looking at the particular rooms of the house without ever having uh, talked about houses while, implemented the room, while implementing the room component itself. Now, ideally, we wouldn't want to have to implement uh, lenses manually every time we need them. Why not define lenses as a composition of fine-grained general lenses? For example, we could have a lens adder that given a pointer to a member of a strux always accesses, accesses through that member, right? And gives you, for example, a room, uh, sorry, the vector of rooms when you give it a house. You can have another one add that gives you the room at a given index when you give it a vector of things. And again, we use this other thing and we compose them with some kind of piping operator. To achieve this, um, it's actually quite useful to have a different representation of lenses. Instead of using a pair of functions, we're going to use only one function. And this function is going to be composable with simple function composition, right? So the typical mathematical function composition where you just call one function after another. Now, to understand these lenses, uh, you need a little bit more advanced function programming concepts. So you have these links here uh, if you're interested 
in learning more about them. You can also check the implementation inside Lager uh, because Lager uses this definition of lenses, which make them uh, very easy to compose. Now, you may be wondering, what about performance, right? Because we are kind of reinventing C++ here, where instead of the dot operator, we're using these lenses and composing them. And a lens is a function that returns a function that returns another function. Is this going to be bad? Well, you can see here uh, where I have actually multiple uh, levels of nesting in lenses. And since lenses are implemented actually with generic lambdas, the compiler can always see through. And even in this case where I define an object, I update it through a lens and then get the final value, the compiler saw through everything and is just uh, resolving the, const the constant that uh, returns at the end. So this is actually a quite efficient abstraction. Now, I'm still not satisfied with this example. Because in this example, we have first, a room component is now a template. And this means that everything is going to be very slow to compile. Um, as soon as uh, you modify anything in your program, basically, uh, all the components are going to need to be recompiled. Because all the components in the end, are instantiated with the house. So whenever any member of the house uh, somewhere in the hierarchy is, is modified, you're going to need to recompile everything. Not good. Um, another problem is that everyone is observing the central state, the house. So whenever anything changes in your application, all the components are going to recompute um, their state. Um, so this is potentially inefficient. This is not ideal. Can we do better? Let's think again about the implementation of the state. The state gets uh, has a getter, a setter and a watch. What if it had another method called zoom that allows you to zoom in part of the, the part of the of the values it contains, and uh, using a lens, and it returns a cursor focused on that part. What is a cursor? Well, a cursor is something that actually has the same API than the state, but it's a bit more abstract. Right? Because it, it can actually reference data that is held up in a state, in its parent state that it's zooming from. So in the cursor, you can get, set, and watch this part. You can even zoom further right, and recursively build trees of cursors. And the implementation of the cursor, I'm using so the code here. It's, of course, going to be a little bit more intricate. Um, keeps somehow um, share pointer to its parent and weak pointers to some kind of children's to propagate notifications. And it keeps a cache of the value, uh, of the last value that it's zooming in. It provides a local signal for changes to that particular part of the tree. And hence, it allows us to solve two things, right? In, a, in one way, it provides a form of type erasure because a cursor of type T doesn't need to know that it's zooming in data that, um, for example, the cursor of type bool can be zooming in data of a house, but the cursor type doesn't reference the house uh, at all. So there is a sense of type erasure here. And it also provides some kind of diffing because as signals propagate changes through the vector of cursors, um, the values uh, are compared and cached with the last versions. Um, short-circuiting the notification propagation, allowing for a more efficient uh, uh, signaling. Once we have this cursor type, we can re-implement the room component. The room component now takes a cursor of bool, right? Because this room component, actually, it could even be called light switch component. Um, 
is just concerned with this Boolean piece of data, uh, the light on state. Whenever the button is clicked, we get the switch on state, the Boolean, negate it and set it. And in the update function, we uh, just look at what the current state is, the Boolean. We can watch it for notification and get uh, notified whenever the Boolean changes. Now we're finally happy. This is the abstraction that all this talk was leading towards. I'm going to let you look at this talk, uh, look at this slide for a second, because this is, um, this is a very important slide. This is what we were trying to achieve, right? To achieve a modular component that receives data in a way that looks like an object you can set and get, but that is stored not in the object itself, in a central single atom store. We're happy. We're happy because now we can have this room component that is not a template and we can combine it with the central state of the house using lenses, the abstraction that we saw before, so we can zoom into uh, the state, we zoom into the rooms, we zoom into the index of the room, and we zoom into the light on state, and we put it in the component. Right? This is equivalent to writing it like this, so instead of composing the lenses directly using the piping operator, we can call zoom multiple times on the cursors that are returned. There is actually an optimization implemented recently in Lager where when you call zoom multiple times like this, um, under the hood, it will actually just compose the lenses without introducing new internal nodes. Um, or instead, we can use what I call the magic access syntax, where we use the square brackets. And, you know, if you look at it, we had a struct and we pass in a member to the struct. So, of course, why do we have to write here utter? We should know that what we want to do here is obvious. We want to access the room. Same thing here. There, we're looking at a vector. If I put, if I pass a, 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 an index and a vector, I should know that what I want to do is to zoom in to the vector at the index. So this magic square bracket uh, of the state allow you to, um, to pass it a key kind of key value, and it will automatically find uh, the right lens to apply uh, for the given uh, T and the, big, the given key. This, this is nice, I find. Uh, so if we look at it, what we have here now in our system is, on the one hand, we have the central state, the big box with a big value. Our model is a big value, right? Uh, and we have a big box, which is the ultimate source of truth in a program. It's a single object that determines what the current state of the application is at a given time. We have our views that form potentially an object-oriented tree of objects. And we have in between this layer of courses that is a library component provided in this Lagger library that I wrote. Um, that abstract the propagation of the data from the central state into the views in a clean way um, that tries to be as unidirectional as possible. So we get a little bit of the best of the both worlds, right? So we can have the views written using UI frameworks like um, Qt, let's say, um, that, you know, it's a traditional way of creating UIs in C++. We don't have something like React, so we don't have uh, another choice. But we can still have a central value-oriented store where we have the usual advantages. I can implement my uh, data model logic not as object 
to functions, I can actually have update functions that I call before calling set in the cursors that actually implement the application logic. I can also easily introduce concurrency in this application because since everything is a value type, you can just copy it very easily, very lightly, pass it to another thread, and then when the thread um, returns uh, in, in some future time, probably using some future abstraction, then you feed this value back into your data model uh, using a cursor set, setter. So the library lagger provides, in this sense, three abstract interfaces, you could say, which is a reader, something that you can get values from and watch for changes in these values, a writer, which is something where you can put in values, and you can also uh, get this cursor, which is a combination of a reader and a writer, right? So this, this kind of has um, the couples kind of const sources, right? Sort uh, readers uh, from sources, uh, value, value sources or data sources that are actually mutable. Now, these interfaces, um, they provide data that are derived from some kind of root. And we saw the state root, which basically is a source of data, a root source of data that represents storage where you can set and get data. And the data may propagate automatically with the automatic tag, or you can use um, an epochal state where actually you need to use a commit method to propagate the data into the system. And this is actually quite useful to make sure that you decouple these components um, and the logic they have from your data model logic. And that you don't have a spaghetti code where in, in, in an observer you're setting other data and you expect it to have certain value at a given time. Um, uh, the values are, set a, are actually propagated in a transactional way using commit. Uh, there is sensors, uh, which is a way to read data using a function from an arbitrary source. And there is a store. And the store is actually the, the lagger store that we saw before that has a dispatch method. Um, and I can treat the store as a reader. So I can actually um, have hybrid architectures where I have Redux for my data model core logic, but I bind it to Qt uh, uh, Q objects using readers, for example. Um, this is actually one of my favorite um, ways to use this library. And then from these roots, we use transformations, right, to get um, readers and writers of all kinds. We have zooming that we saw. We can get um, uh, zoom into the data using a lens. But we can also do other things. We can use a transducer with the XForm method. I, I'm going to talk about transducer very briefly in a second. Um, I can use width to combine multiple cursors into one. Right? So I, I can actually have different sources of data and combine it into one single source of data. And I put this cross-thread thing here. It's actually not implemented in the library. The library is single-threaded, but I could have special transformations, for example, that allows you to cross-thread boundaries um, using this data course or abstraction as the data propagation uh, point. It's a very good way to, to, um, to do this share by passing data instead of uh, share by you know using mutexes and, and, a, uh, and a locked object. Now let's talk about transducers for a second because interestingly we were thinking of cursors as a box, right? Um, but a box is a snapshot, and we were looking not always at the snapshots of the value that is contained in, in the box. What if we consider the cursor a sequence of values over time? If we consider it a sequence of values 
why not apply sequence transformation functions, right? Um, like filter or like transform or, or mapping. For example, I can consider having a filter transformation that only gets uh, only lets the, the, the even elements through. And using this, I get a reader where the odd values never show up. We can also use this to change the type, to make a transformation that transforms the data. And now I get a reader of, for example, the strings uh, that are going through that integer sequence. This is something that I can also achieve with lenses, to be honest. But we can also achieve it with uh, a transducer. Now, so tra I could um, implement this filter map and a million uh, sequence transformation functions in my library, but why not do it in a generic way? And that's what a transducer does. In the, in the same way that lenses generalizes the concepts of zooming into a, into, into a, a collection, sorry, into a value, um, a transducer generalizes the concept of transforming a sequence. And it does so, crucially, in a way that works both for push-based sequences and for pool-based sequences. This is the reason why, sadly, we could not use something like range v3 or the new ranges library in the standard, because the ranges library in the standard is an amazing abstraction, but it only works with pool-based sequences. But transducers works with both. Um, and since this is a general construction, uh, I have actually implemented it in a separate library called SAG, and here is the link to it. And the uh, all the transformations that are provided by this library. If you want to know more about the concept also, I would recommend watching this talk from CPPCon 2015, actually a few years ago already, um, where I explain uh, that concept of that transducer more deeply. Okay, let's, um, let's take a break here and look at an, an example, a real world example. Um, that um, binds these concepts together. I'm gonna check the chat here to see if there are some questions in there also. All right. Um, so what I'm gonna show you now is a little application here. Let me make sure I use it. Um, uh, the right terminal here. So here I have uh, an application that is actually provided as an example in the Lager repository. Uh, I remember Lager is the library that provides um, all these kind of value-oriented design uh, architecture um, building blocks. And it's a, can, a typical to-do app application, right? So this is, um, um, it has become a standard of showing how different frameworks work when building web applications. So I thought maybe it's also a good way to show how to make an application, in this case, a desktop application built using Qt and QML. So when I open this application, I have this input where I can put, uh, I can use to introduce to-do items. So for example, give a talk, and at some point finish the talk, don't run too much, right? Um, and since this is a desktop application, I can actually save it and load it. So I'm going to load uh, a to-do list that I have already for this conference. Um, and I have here, you know, different elements. And probably doing the C++ talk is almost done now. And I don't think I can really do this because I don't have the knowledge. So I'm going to delete it. All right. So... We can see here, we can do the typical data model um, uh, updates and the UI reacts to it in a nice way. 
So let's go back to our slides. Let's think a little bit about how this application is built. And to build this application, as I mentioned, um, I've used Qt, uh, the UI framework that probably many of you have used. And I've used in particular QML. And QML is a programming language, a superset of JavaScript that um, the Qt library provides that allows you to write UIs in a declarative way. Um, I say declarative with scare quotes because the underlying data model that we use to, or that um, Qt expects you to provide for this UI is still written in an object way. However, um, the, the framework already provides very nice things like automatic data binding. So uh, for instance, here um, I have a window which has you know, a button and some text, and there are expressions that um, like model dong here uh, that determine the, the, the state of the UI. And when the model changes, this will change automatically, right? So here I'm just declaring the relationship between the, the model state and the color. Um, and eventually I also have callbacks here, like on click, where I, uh, with uh, little imperative functions, say how, for example, should the model be updated. So this is a very convenient, nice way to write UIs, um, where uh, you have your QML UI, and normally you have a C++ data model. Now, the C++ data model is implemented using Qt Q objects. And this Q object um, has certain states, like for example, whether the to-do item is done or not. It has a property declared with this funny syntax here that says that there is a DOM property that you can get, set, and that emit changes. And finally, you implement in C++ this getter, this setter, and sometimes you notify changes. Now, what's crucial here is that this Q object, even though it looks similar to our state cursor abstraction, it's very object-y, object-oriented in the sense that it encapsulates and hides its own state, right? It contains this bool property, which is the data model fundamentally, the data model of the item. And it's expected to change whenever you want to change things. What we want to do instead, I don't want to write Q objects for my data model, right? Actually, ideally, why does my data model need to know about Qt at all? Right? I, I want to be my, my data model to be agnostic of the framework that I'm using for the UI. Why not use very simple data types like this one? A to-do item is a struct that contains the DOM flag and the text. That's it. I can copy, pass by value. It's a very simple, stupid data type. The, data, the model of the application itself, well, it's the collection of to-do items and potentially, let's say, the name of the document. Crucially, I'm using here the flex vector from the email library. This is the, data, the library of immutable data structures that I mentioned before that make um, all this actually quite efficient. It's not important to know now. Just think of it as um, a, a more value uh, oriented or a more functional um, version of uh, STD vector. Once I have a data model implemented, uh, defined like this, then my application logic, you know, what some people like to call business logic, but not, not all applications are businesses, I would say, um, have, um, I can implement it as pure functions, functions that take by value and return by value, right? So I, to add an item, a I can simply get the model by value, return the new model with the item with the text in it, right? And I don't know, I, I love this slide because 
this is very simple C++. It's, it doesn't have templates. It doesn't have inheritance. It doesn't have pointers. This code can be written by, by a C++ novice, somebody that doesn't know much of C++. And it can be really good code. And these functions are very easy to test because you pass it a value, get a, the value updated, so you can compare very easily is the input, is, uh, sorry, is the output what I expect compared to the input that I pass to it. Um, and these functions can also, as I said before, uh, as I hinted before, be easily parallelized because if I want to call this in another thread, I can just capture the module the value in in, the, in a lambda or, or pass it as an argument to, to the STD thread, and and that's it. This is very very simple. Now this is so simple that you will say, well, how do I write a UI against this? There is no way for me to listen for changes. We can use cursors. So, I'm going to need some kind of queue object that binds, connects the data model that we saw, our idealized data model, to the, the world of QT. So, I can use the data model that I saw directly from QML. This queue object is going to have, for every property, that I want to expose to QML, it's going to have a cursor, right? So we had a property for DOM. So we have a cursor for the Boolean. We have a cursor for a Q string that has the text uh, of, the, of the object. Now, implementing these, uh, the Q properties associated to these cursors is systematic, right? So in the getter, I call get on the cursor. In the setter, I call set on the cursor. And there is a signal that we will eventually connect to the watcher using watch on the cursor. Here we have uh, the other property. And finally, we have the constructor. Now, the constructor takes a cursor from a to-do item, the to-do item that is the model, um, our model to-do item, and what it will do is to slice this cursor such that in the end we get the data in the right form in the cursors that are associated to the property. So the DOM property will be associated to the attribute DOM and the text um, is going to be going through the text member of the item of our data model, but we also need to transform it. And in this case, for example, I'm going to use the, the transducer API to transform it uh, because that was an std string and here we're expecting Q strings, right? So we specify here how to get um, them back and forth. I could also use a lens uh, that then I can reuse in different parts of, of the program. And finally, I also need to watch, as I said before, the cursors that I defined above, such that when they change, we notify Qt that things changed. Now, this is all boilerplate, if you think about it. So actually, the library provides um, this macro uh, in, in a special module for people using Qt. The library doesn't depend on Qt, but if you are using Qt, it provides special facilities for those using Qt, where um, it just defines a cursor and a property bound together uh, such that the only thing that I need to know is to connect, uh, feed these cursors with data, right? And I do this in the constructor. So this is our, you can call this a view model object, right? That, uh, that takes a value-oriented data model and is connecting it to an uh, object-oriented interface expected by Qt. Um, that was the to-do item, right? The nested element of our composition. Now we can define another Q object for our uh, the data model of the to-do application as a whole. And here I can have a lagger state directly because uh, this is the root of our application. So not only do we have 
a cursor to the to the model, but we can actually directly hold the state of of, of the to the models. Uh, I can define again cursors and readers that zoom into particular properties, like for example, how many to do items there are, um, and what is the name of the document that is open. And in the constructor, as we did before, we describe the data flow of information from the state into the particular parts. Right. So the name is going to be the attribute again with the funny uh, Q string transformations, and uh, for the number of elements, we just uh, use this thing to this transformation to. Uh, figure out what's the size of the vector of to do's. Um, then I have to provide a method to get from the to do in that to do item at a particular index to a view model of that, right? Um, and we do this by constructing the Q object that we defined before, and we pass it a cursor that is derived from a state using lenses like this, right? So it's a to-do at the given index. Very simple. Interestingly here, I'm just allocating with new and returning because QML does this thing that if you call a Q invocable and the Q invocable returns a Q object, it will manage uh, using garbage collection, the, the lifetime of that object. And since the lifetime of that object is decoupled from uh, the lifetime of everything else using cursors, because cursors internally use, uh, use shared pointers and, and I don't have to worry, I can always pass them by value in a safe way, um, the, this just works. Right? And, and it's it's very nice. And this item will update whenever I change anything. And, and since uh, the cursors under the hood, right? They use the data as the source for changes. They don't use the setter, the setting um, thing. Whatever thing you set at any level of the hierarchy will be always uh, correct, uh, notified correctly to the UI. We delegate in the framework to, to do the differing and notification for us. Um, and finally, in our model, we can have functions like add, remove, and save, and load that implement the application logic that we saw before. And we can do so just by calling these functions into um, these updates. What's update? Well, update, I didn't show it before because it's a very trivial function that combines get and set. So you pass it a function that takes a model and returns the updated model, and you call update on a cursor, any kind of cursor, you can call it on a state or, or, or any other thing satisfying the cursor interface, and it will um, it will just update uh, the internal state using, using that function. And that's it. That's our data model for our application, and then you just have to write the, the UI. So we went from our very nice and tidy data model to our object-oriented looking QT-based view model without sacrificing the properties that we wanted to have. So it's time to reach a conclusion. We have looked deeply into this talk uh, in the concept of cursors. And cursors is a new abstraction, remember this, that on the one hand allows us to resolve the impedance mismatch between value-based data models and object-oriented user interfaces or even other object-oriented reactive, interactive kind of systems. This is what we saw in the in the to-do list example. 
And we didn't see an example of this, but you can easily imagine how it also allows you to do an incremental redesign of an object-oriented data model to a value-oriented data model. Because if you have a value-oriented data model, you can start by introducing states, state cursors, at the leaves of your system, right, where, where you have already stateful properties somewhere in your data model objects, you replace them by states. Then you replace the consumers of this data model, the UIs, to use the state API when they want to modify it. And in the next step of the refactoring, you go one step up, change the parent object into a state, and change the children that you had before a state into cursors that are derived from the parent. And you go step by step following this refactoring approach. And at the end, you will have um, converted all your application into a value-oriented data model where the old data model is a shell. It's a view model that can be consumed by object-oriented UIs, but you also have a new value-oriented data model that you can use um, uh, in a value-oriented way wherever you need it. There is a question here that says, the cursors and lenses seem to reference the root container. Are they therefore not concurrency safe? That is correct. They are not concurrency safe. Uh, you're expected to use cursors um, from, all the, uh, from the same thread. Um, as I hinted before, um, you can actually implement a cursor transformation that allows you to move uh, to a different thread in a children cursor. So, um, so actually, uh, there is here the fundamental tool that will allow you to move between threads. Um, here, the concurrency safety is given you by the value orientation of the underlying data model. So the idea normally, uh, or actually in the applications that I use, in the end, I have um, the, the UI thread where um, the cursor hierarchy leaves and is updated. And I have other threads where I send data to and receive data from in forms of in forms of values, and they are not concerned with cursors normally. Um, there is another question. Are there any examples of using the library with dear in GUI in a similar way to Qt? Is less code required to glue things together? Yes, actually, the um, to-do item data model that I just described is used also to implement an in GUI-based uh, to-do list application. And that is actually compiled with uh, WebAssembly, so you can use it from from a, a, a from a browser, even though it's written in C plus uh, plus, and that's included in in the examples. Um, so if we look here at the examples to do, uh, there is an GUI an GUI folder there where you can find the the code. Um, now. What I've talked here also, this is all mm, not really experimental. This is not science fiction. Um, this is uh, code that I use in, with my clients in real world applications. Uh, Prenav, Capella, and Bronze, they are some of my clients that are actually using this library in production. Um, and Omicron use a custom version that I implemented for them at some point. And a lot of the ideas that I, that I, I'm explaining here, I actually developed uh, uh, or, or had my initial um, kind of insights developed already more than five years ago when, when I worked for Ableton and I developed, for example, the transducer library that I showed before. And I'm very thankful for, for the support they gave me at that time developing these concepts. Uh, I would also like to thank people like Catherine Miller, uh, Carl Busse, and Maria Carrasco, who has actually supported uh, with their code and their insight um, the development of this uh, library in different ways. And I would also like to uh, make a little bit of advertising here and ask you to, um, if you like the ideas presented here, become a GitHub sponsor by making uh, a small economic contribution. Um, you know, these ideas uh, that I'm presenting here have developed over many years. It's all uh, available uh, using uh, liberal 
uh, Libre software and open source software licenses for everyone to use. So particularly if you're using these um, libraries in a commercial project, there are many different sponsor tiers that you can join on GitHub and make a, a, a contribution to, to help me continue developing this uh, in the future because I, I really love these uh, these ideas. I love these frameworks. I put a lot of love in them and I really hope I, I find the time to continue maintaining and developing them and improving them in the future. Um, also, I would like to reference here uh, Tony Van Aert, who actually, <laughs> at the same time that I developed this talk, he had simultaneously developed these other talks uh, without talking to each other, really, um, uh, that has a very similar title and a very similar con uh, content, but coming from a different angle. So he's not introducing a new library. He's more introducing a set of principles that you can use in general when combining this object-oriented and value-oriented world. It's interestingly not the first time that this happens to us. Also, uh, we started using the word postmodern in the title of talks, I think, at the same time without having talked to each other. This talk uh, from him, you can have the YouTube link. Um, I can share it also later in the chat for everyone to host. Um, finally, a little quote. Um, from Eduardo Galeano. Because, you know, when I talk about value-oriented design, people often tell me, yeah, like, that's, that's great, but it's impossible to use in systems that are object-oriented. I will say, push forward. We push, 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 and in the end, we found abstractions that allowed us to reconcile the two systems and explore a little bit further. It's all going step by step. You don't have to start in a full value-oriented design world. You can start with an object-oriented system and move step by step to a value-oriented design. I think this philosophy of moving step by step towards an ideal can be represented in this quote. Utopia is like the horizon. I move two steps closer, it moves two steps away. I walk another 10 steps and the horizon runs 10 steps further away. As much, as much as I may walk, I'll never reach it. So what's the point of utopia? That's the point, to keep walking. Thank you very much. Um, here are the links uh, to all the libraries. Um, there is uh, a question about uh, where the example is available. It's available directly in the repository uh, of the library. So if you click here um, and go to, it's going to break the world. If you go to this website, um, you have here the to-do example, right? Uh, and you have the IMGUI version that I described before. You have the QML version um, with the data model, more or less as described in the slides here, actually. So, so that code was mostly just real code. Um, any other questions? Um, I can wait here for a little bit uh, for you to, to post more questions on the Q&A section. Also, if you would like to simply have a chat with me about these ideas, I will probably stay in the room some, so um, yeah, we can have a chat about this. Was the cursor idea yours? No, I didn't invent this um, from scratch. Um, actually, the cursor concept, I first encountered it in uh, Clojure. So Clojure is a functional programming language for the JVM and also for JavaScript. And there was a very nice framework for Clojure that was a React wrapper that introduced a form of this idea of Cursor. And it was in a project at Ableton where um, another developer that was a very Clojure fan convinced me to actually use it. And I was, wow, this is great. And, and at some point, this project, we tried to use Clojure in the beginning. It didn't work in the end for performance reasons. We had to move to C++, but I really wanted to, to keep using that design approach. And I eventually got 
to cursors um, in C++. And this idea evolved, so the concept of cursor that I introduced here, of course, has departed somehow from the one in Clojure. Uh, so this notion of, for example, using lenses, uh, was in, I introduced myself, uh, same for the idea of using transducers, and, and you know, it's, it's been a, an evolution where you have influences from, from many points. Uh, but definitely closure has been a great influence for me in adopting a value-oriented design uh, approach because uh, I think closure, so closure is a functional programming language. But even in functional programming, I think there are many ways to do it. And I think closure is the first language that beyond whatever functional fanciness, like monads, uh, whatever higher order functions, it has this idea at, at its core, which is everything is a value. And this idea you can apply in many languages and you can definitely apply in C++. C++ is a great language for value-oriented design. Um, so yeah, if you're curious about these ideas, maybe an exposure, an ex uh, an exposure to closure is actually a, a good way to, uh, to also maybe deepen your understanding of, of this. Another question, in your experience, how long does it take for teams to become productive using these libraries once they've internalized these ideas? Do you notice a reduced defect rate using this approach? Um, it depends a lot on the, on the experience of the developers. And interestingly, actually, developers that are more senior don't necessarily get productive faster in these ideas. Um, I've actually often noticed that developers that, for example, have been writing JavaScript and UIs in Java, JavaScript using Redux, and they move to C++, uh, to a C++ project, project for the first time, and that uses this library, they feel at home. And, and they can write C++ code productively very soon without having, you know, a deep understanding of how memory in C++ works and all this stuff. And it's great for them. Maybe a developer that has been writing C++ for 20 years, but doesn't have um, maybe experience in functional programming or writing UIs using web frameworks like Redux or React may actually take a little bit longer to kind of disentangle these objects, notions in, in their mind and, and stop worrying about the performance of copying and, and stop thinking about how do I get a pointer to the thing that I want to have. Um, so it depends. Uh, the second part of the question, do you notice a reduced defect rate using this approach? Um, I would say yes. Of course, I haven't conducted an empirical uh, study on this, and I'm biased because <laughs> I'm, uh, in general, quite passionate about these ideas. But I've definitely seen, um, been in code reviews where people were trying to do things uh, in in an object-oriented way, particularly in the context of concurrency, and they had race conditions that I could spot. And eventually, I told them, "Look, just use." This other way, just pass the data uh, using, uh, for example, if you're using the Redux thing, pass it to another thread and then dispatch it, or pass it to another thread, then pass it back and set it. And once they internalize this um, this way of working, they stopped introducing concurrency and race conditions in, in, in future uh, co concurrency code that they wrote, because uh, by using this approach, they, they, there is way less space for, for that kind of mistake. Any other question? Uh, I think anyway, we're running out of time. I don't know when we'll be shut down. But as I said, I will be uh, around. So if you can fit in the same table, maybe we can have a, a chat in person or drop me an email if you're interested or want to use this in, in any other uh, place. <laughs>